Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeffrey Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. Hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in, be sure to hit the subscribe button on the iTunes side of things or wherever you listen to podcasts. That helps spread the word of everything we're doing here at Focus Compounding. So this past weekend... The best thing came out, and that was Buffett's 2020 annual report um, letter, or Mm -hmm. I guess his chairman letter uh, that comes out every single year. Obviously, a lot of people love reading it and, um, you know, learning from it. And I guess before we jump into it, what were your initial first impressions? Uh, Like it? Hate it? Kind of like it? Kind of hated it? I kind of liked it. I liked it. One of those. I actually yeah. really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. There was there was some pushback by people online that I saw, okay, which we so could I get into. That. Yeah. I mean, I haven't read anything about it. Yeah. I've, I've read it a couple times, but I haven't looked at anything online. Yeah. Um, so we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, but I have it pulled up if you're watching on YouTube and we could go, um, uh, you know, and, and chat about it a little bit. Um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway or Berkshire earned $42.5 billion in 2020, according to Gap. Uh, the four components of that figure are $21.9 billion of operating earnings, $4.9 billion of realized capital gains, a $26.7 billion gain from an increase in the amount of net unrealized capital gains that exists in the stocks we hold. And finally, $11 billion loss from a write down in the value of a company, which we'll talk about, uh, Precision Cast Parts. And actually, I have um, a quick FS pulled up, okay. which we could go and look at the company and talk a little bit about that. Um, if not in this episode, we'll definitely dedicate a, another podcast to it that's going to come out this week. Um, but a pretty good year for Berkshire, would you say? Uh, yeah, I think it was a okay year for Berkshire. I mean, I think it's an unusual year, so I don't know how to evaluate it. Mm-hmm. He talks about the four biggest components, and those are the ones that really matter. Um, one of them is Apple, but then three are completely owned. That part was pretty fascinating, right? Even though he yeah. doesn't have a controlling position in Apple, he still thinks about it as being a it's, very meaningful part to you it, know sort of their big four. Yeah, and it's also not... Um, it, it's the second of the big four, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. It's insurance, Apple, and then energy and railroad. I think he actually makes that clear. In lists I've seen... Um, before people talking about it like that apple's important to them i think people put it as like number four Mm -hmm. um but actually it's kind of the second most important thing to them Mm -hmm. um berkshire made no sizable acquisitions and operating earnings fell nine percent but what was interesting was he said berkshire's per share intrinsic value by both retaining earnings and repurchasing about five percent of their shares uh increased so he said even though that they didn't make uh, any sizable acquisitions and operating earnings fell about nine percent uh, intrinsic value of berkshire hathaway increased because they bought about five percent uh back of their uh their stock yeah and the decline in operating earnings was mostly attributable to uh covid mm-hmm so what I thought was interesting was he went in a little bit of a postmortem on precision cast parts. Mm-hmm. It was, I believe, in... Okay, so when did you make it? 2016? It sounds I like think that's right. they paid, what, I think $37 billion. Okay. $35 billion, yeah. $37 They wrote billion. it down by like a third or something. Yeah, yeah. so it was, they wrote it off by, yeah, it was like 30% or something. Um, what I thought was interesting, and he talked a little bit about it, you know, typical Buffett, he, he's writing this letter for his partners. Mm-hmm. That's one thing that I love, right? Okay. Every single letter he writes, there's one thing that comes to my mind. It's partnership, right? So he's writing this letter for Mm -hmm. his partners and he's taking, you know, ownership of the decision to invest in precision and the write down. And he says, I was simply too optimistic about PCC's uh, normalized profit potential. Last year, my miscalculation was laid bare by adverse developments throughout the aerospace industry. And I just, I don't know why, I guess I wrote it down when I was reading that he continues to get smoked and anything that's like tied to like aerospace, airlines, airlines, you know, anything like that. Um, But he said, I believe I was right in concluding that PCC would over time earn good returns on the net tangible assets deployed in its operations. I was wrong, however, in judging the average amount of future earnings and consequently wrong in my calculation of the proper price to pay for the business. So basically saying that he overpaid for the company. Probably because he overestimated cyclically normal earnings. Mm hmm. Um, I think that's true, that he paid too high a PE where the E is the average normal earnings. Mm-hmm. Um, it was another purchase where he's done a few before where the 
um, margins were strong already compared to what they have been historically. I think we'll see if we go and look at it, uh, which is similar to like Burlington Northern and uh, Lubrizol. They were purchases like that too. But then in this case, he misjudged it. In the case of like Burlington Northern, it continued to get better. Mm -hmm. um, he then went in to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, conglomerates mm -hmm. and to really trash a lot of the bad things that come with finance and excess leverage and all that. Yeah, I thought this like was that. very interesting because I felt a lot of this was his way of writing about today without actually saying anything directly about today. Exactly, and I put that right there. Because he lived through the 1960s conglomerate craze. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, which he, was a highly speculative, retail investor-driven period, all about these um, personalities who controlled these stocks. Yeah, mm -hmm. It was fascinating, and that's whole, you know, Buffett's, I guess, his MO, criticized by the group, not, you know, people individually. Mm -hmm. And... He didn't say SPAC, no. but you could tell that he was alluding to just everything that's going right. on right now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with SPACs and just everything, you know, just access everywhere. Yeah. And I also thought elsewhere where he talks about the different categories of investors who own Berkshire stock, he separates out individuals from institutions, talks a little bit about them. I thought that was also interesting given what's going on now. Mm hmm um yeah i love that conglomerates earned their terrible reputation <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. i had to uh had to highlight that um uh, and especially there was the one line where he thought i thought was the most important line in the letter where he said that the mere fact that the stock has gone up is used as proof that the um reality is true basically that the you know if you have an idea a story for a stock you know there's a story behind it the fact that the stock performs well for a while then makes it seem like there's reality to something whether there is or isn't and i, and I, was... I always wonder about that right because you know sometimes people come to you with ideas or you know come to you with stocks and you could mm -hmm. pass or invest in or whatever and then let's say because of the way 2020 played out let's say that stock is now up like 60 percent right were they right in their investment thesis so they're speculator they were right i mean soros i think in the 60s thing his belief is you buy into the conglomerates, even though it's all fake and stuff, as the story builds up and and all that. And then once faith is lost in the, you know, charismatic leader of the company and stuff, then you get out. Mm -hmm. You you play into the bubble and you make the most of it. And then you buy those stocks after they collapse. Buffett bought some of those stocks after they collapsed, actually, in national student marketing and things like that. Um, but he didn't buy them before the that bubble burst. Mm -hmm. Well, it was like what George, uh, George Soros always says. The first thing he does when he sees a bubble is goes out and buys it. Right. Whereas Buffett basically shut down his partnership. Mm -hmm. um, I thought this paragraph was really interesting. He was talking about, you know, investing and he was like, I guess, the scoring system itself. He said, you are awarded no points in business endeavors for degree of difficulty. Furthermore, as Ronald Reagan cautioned, it said that hard work never killed anyone. But I say, why take the chance? Mm -hmm. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, he says those sorts of things a lot. Yeah, and I noted that. Um, and I just noted that like he's talked about how much easier it is to um, buy better businesses. And I did make a note of like, you know, that's a big part of it. It's not just that he believes that better businesses actually perform better than the value investing he was doing. A big part of it is his life is so much better not having to own Dempster Mill and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so even when you have a poor performer like precision cast parts um, because you pay too much. It's a, your life is not as difficult as when you have a poor performer in like a net net or something. And you know, some of those worked out, he made money on them eventually, but they're a tough way to, to um, you know, to live and stuff. And so I think it makes his life easier that way. And I think that was part of his choice about those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that seems to fit his like personality too, right? I mm -hmm. mean, if you read the snowball and kind of how he, structures his life and i guess the relationships close to him that just seems very much like buffett to me yeah i don't think he'd be happy he was still running a, a partnership a hedge fund you know for all those years yeah he said they said but charlie and also my 20-year struggle with textile operation i inherited at berkshire finally convinced me that owning a non-controlling portion of a wonderful business is more profitable more enjoyable and far less work than struggling with 100 percent of a marginal enterprise yeah and I, I think it's interesting because I think other investors, when talking about Buffett, kind of say that he said, you make more money doing that stuff. And I don't think he's ever said that. I think what he said is working with big amounts of money and uh, it, you can't do the cheap things. And it's just easier and more fun to buy things, better things for the long term. Mm -hmm. I think he's always stressed that part of it. You know, it, he's with Berkshire, he's done 20 percent a year for a long time, you know. Could he have maximized it by doing some deep value thing sometimes or whatever that would 
be as aggravating as the experience you have with textiles or buying to things that are unionized and that you have to, you know, do things and liquidate things and fire people and whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, just so you could do 23% a year or something. Yeah. No, I agree with that. What were your thoughts on when he was talking about bonds? Oh, he doesn't like bonds. Mm -hmm. They are not the place to be these days. Yeah. And the big advantage that Berkshire's insurance operations have and why I, if I was going to buy insurance, things would look at something like Berkshire is, I mean, I've, I've written up for the website recently, an asset manager and uh, an insurance company, title insurance company. And the big caution with both of them is I don't think that their returns will be very good. So even though you're paying not a high um, price for the stocks, you're paying, you're looking at like this isn't a very big premium to book or something, but what you're putting your money into is a mix that's a lot of bonds and some stocks too. I mean, in the case of an insurer, even ones that are pretty heavily weighted to equities compared to other insurers, you're buying a very, you know, overvalued bond portfolio. And that's such a huge drag on future returns that maybe they shouldn't be trading at, you know, above book value and stuff, even though they have combined ratios below 100. Because the question is like, would you buy, people use price to book for Berkshire, for instance, but would you buy the portfolio that they have? Now, Berkshire is a lot of stocks. It's not a lot of bonds. It's not a lot of long-term bonds at all. But when looking at other insurers and things like that, are people saying, oh, the price to book is 0.9? Okay, but if I offered you bonds, mostly government bond portfolio that had a yield slightly higher than the one now, because I'm giving it to you for 10% off, would you really want to buy it? Is Mm -hmm. that what you really want to be in? Because that's what your book value is. Mm -hmm. Berkshire now has $138 billion of insurance float in the war chest. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was interesting is, too, he said that it has been costless to us. Yes. And he's always said that it could cost them, you know, at, at some point. Right. But it's been costless to them. And then he says that happy result, of course, could change. But over time, I like our odds. Yeah. I think the odds, I, I think Berkshire's insurance business has gone much, much better over time. Um, and it's, Is that like just a scale thing or what? No, I think their operations were pretty poor at the beginning. Their original entry into it wasn't that good. I mean, they bought National Indemnity. And that was the only success they had for a long time. Geico's a huge success. Um, they've had uh, Ajit Jain for, what, 30 years or something now? Um, more than that, actually. Um, and then uh, they've had more like 35 years, probably. And then um, they the General Re acquisition helped them out. So, I mean, Buffett's best stock picking and stuff was probably through 1995, I'd say, but Berkshire's insurance operations from 95 today have gotten pretty strong. Um, they were already getting strong, but it's a really good, for a large insurer, it's a really strong operation. Um, Geico is a very strong insurer uh, and, you know, it would be worth a lot of money if it was trading on its own. It would probably be valued like Progressive is. Mm-hmm. So the insurance operation would be number one, right, mm-hmm. of the four. Um, and then, uh, you know, number two could be uh, Burlington Northern. Right or apple okay i wouldn't value it that way i'd say the insurance is the most important part to berkshire number two is apple number tied for number four tied for number three however you want to put it is um burlington northern or the energy uh electric Mm -hmm. uh, utility um why would you put apple number two well because when i value the companies i mean if you're gonna use the market value for apple it's higher than the value of either burlington northern um or uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, it's called, right? BHE, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah, well, I mean, we know what the market value of Apple is. You could say, is it too high or too low or whatever? Um, Burlington Northern is probably worth about the same as Union Pacific. So we know what the market cap of Union Pacific is. Um, their stake in Apple is worth more than the Union Pacific is worth. So I would say pretty clearly it's Apple. Mm-hmm. I don't, what order did he put them in? Uh, he did insurance. Uh, and then we said our second and third most valuable asset. It's pretty much a toss up at this point. Our Berkshire's 100% ownership of BNSF and Apple. And yeah. then he used uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy as number four. I would say that's fair if you're not going on the market value of Apple, which he probably isn't. Mm-hmm. So in other words, are railroads uh, cheaper than Apple? Like, mm-hmm. are they trading at a more reasonable multiple? Probably, yeah. I thought it was fascinating when he was talking about Berkshire Hathaway Energy that their earnings have grown from 122 million to 3.4 billion uh, right. during the 21 years that they've owned the company. And I did the Kager on it. It was a 17% Kager. Right. Pretty impressive. And that's purely because they're the only um, utility that retains their earnings. All others pay dividends. Mm-hmm. So 
we've talked about that with banks and things before. You can grow a bank or an insurer or something a lot. Most don't grow because they pay dividends. No other utility I'm aware of doesn't pay dividends. Yeah. And uh-huh. it's never paid a dividend to Berkshire at all. Berkshire's never received a dividend from that company, I believe. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on him talking a lot about buybacks, like with Apple? I thought that was great how we laid that out for the I others. think he's making it clear where Berkshire's going to spend its money. I mean, uh, they sold stock. They sold Apple. They sold airlines. They didn't buy other things. And they've been buying back their stock. And that was another question I had from you. Buffett doesn't trim. And they trimmed Apple. He believes his stock is cheaper than the stocks they own. Probably buy a lot. Mm-hmm. So you Otherwise, think, why do that? Do you think then that we're going to start to see him buy back a lot of their stock? Berkshire? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think the reason the buyback stuff has shifted. So if you look at the last two years, for instance which they have in the beginning of the letter, you can actually see it, is um, the S&P 500 is probably up 50 or 60% with dividends, something like that. Berkshire's up like 15. Um, if you look at the four component parts of Berkshire versus the S&P, I don't believe, there, I don't believe and I don't believe he believes that the S&P 500 has grown its intrinsic value any faster than Berkshire has. So it's gr- gone up four times faster the last two years than his stock. So when people ask about like, why aren't you buying back your stock? Why, or why aren't you buying stock in the S&P uh, type companies? Right now, it may be that Berkshire looks very reasonable compared to what else he could do with the money. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's other places he could put a lot of money that look as good as Berkshire. Mm-hmm. But see, a couple of years ago, that wasn't the case. If you look going back like 2016 or something, uh, yeah, probably about that far. Berkshire and the S&P maybe the divergence in valuation wasn't so far apart. So he could find something like Apple or something like that. You know, he had hope that he could find something like that. But now with the amount of money that he has, I think there's less hope for that versus buying Berkshire today. And other stocks have become so much more expensive as well. Yeah, that's what I mean. That he probably doesn't see it as, oh, it's a toss up. If yeah. it's a toss up, he won't buy back Berkshire. Mm-hmm. I just don't think that he think he would rather buy more stuff and not buy it back if he's in doubt about it. Yeah. So I think when he buys back Berkshire, he's saying it's better than my other choices that I could make. Yeah. Well, when we talked about it so many times on this podcast, why Apple was such a great investment is because he could just buy so much of it as well. Yes. I think Apple was very special that way for him. In a lot of ways, there are other very big stocks. There are very few very big stocks that are based all around like one brand. Mm -hmm. Um, Apple also is very rare for a big stock in that its capital allocation is clear or seem to be clear. It doesn't really buy other stuff. It's willing to buy back its own stock. It's not probably going to do a transformative um, merger with Mm -hmm. someone. Yeah. Um, Things like that. That Buffett stage where he's like interested. It's a lot like Coke, Mm -hmm. right? When he bought into Coke, something like that. Like for Berkshire at its size of how important Coke could be and things like that. I mean, Berkshire's so much bigger and Apple is so much bigger. But um, it's that sort of thing where you could make, uh, buy that much of something that was so simple. I mean, it's largely one product. I mean, it's, it's a few products all very connected to the same brand. It's, you know that kind of thing there's just not other companies like that mm-hmm. anything else you would buy kind of is a conglomerate you know that's that sort of size yeah and he said berkshire has repurchased more shares since year end and is likely to further reduce its share count in the future yeah that's why i think that they're gonna buy back like crazy mm-hmm. i had to uh note uh byd their their cost and then the market value of that i thought that was fascinating so 232 and million happened, like at once basically and then yeah. five point it went nowhere for billion. a while and yeah. then yeah went up a huge amount and then what i thought was interesting was this was very much a he gets into this part of the letter we start yes. to talk about different parts of their businesses and i was like this almost feels like i'm watching the end of a documentary okay and it's almost like my life flashed before my eyes type of thing I interpreted this section differently. I felt this was his way of not dealing with anything political. Smart. But making a political statement. He stressed... This is You were talking about the companies they bought? Yeah. yeah. He stressed founder-led entrepreneurial companies in, that were not... Uh, now, Seas was in California, but he didn't stress the California part at all, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that were not in New York and California, mm. that were not innovative, that were not... Like uh, mom and pop. Too, yeah, you know? he yeah. talked about Nebraska. He talked about the Seas. He talked, you know... Yes. He didn't talk about capitalism. Uh-huh. But he didn't say capitalism. Yeah. And then he said, you know, you can see the part where he talks about the progress has been very uneven and whatever and those sorts of things about um, for different kinds of people in the country and the more perfect union part. But he kind of was talking about that sort of thing, I think, how 
Yeah. Uh, that's a, how I interpret a large part of this section. A lot of people pointed out that he didn't talk about the pandemic. He didn't talk about anything political. He didn't talk about a lot of what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what a lot of people were maybe thrown off by, upset by, whatever. I personally I read thought s- it was. I thought his letter was great. I probably wouldn't talk about any of that stuff either. Yeah, I read some of his stuff as not political, if you mean like who got elected and who didn't and stuff, but as... Well, you know, people said about us, why are we talking about okay. a lot of the pandemic? I, I read some of it as... There's a section that I read as Berkshire has one stakeholder. It's shareholders. Mm-hmm. Because Jamie Dimon and some people like that who have, had been involved with a group that made a decision to do idea of a corporation exists for reasons besides making a profit. And there's actually a section in this... Um, letter where he talks about how berkshire serves the interests of the communities that it's in the people it employs Mm. um, those sorts of things and wants to do good by its customers and all that kind of stuff but none of these people own the company they don't get a vote on matters whatever and then he talks about all the other stuff um i think in that section he said you know and i think also with that section um he made a point that the charity that basically there isn't going to be he didn't say this clearly but there isn't going to be a warren buffett trust controlling this company he said the shares will be emptied Mm -hmm. and in other people's hands basically which is that berkshire won't be run for philanthropic uh reasons ever and there are companies that run like that Mm -hmm. you know hershey's you know Uh, he could have done that left them that way instead he's chosen to sell it off over time in fact insisted that the money be spent and stuff Mm -hmm. so it's not even like the gates foundation will control berkshire stock forever Mm -hmm. he's saying it will be sold off to the general Mm -hmm. public you know it will never be run for those reasons it was back to this idea of partnership like yes like if you could title this report or letter anything it would i would title it partnership and he very much understands that as the ceo he works for the shareholders Right. right, that's what his job is as CEO, and it's his, and the, individual the shareholders, shareholders own it. Yeah, are the ones who are going to stick around. Mm-hmm. The institutional ones don't count. Was his point? Mm-hmm. The his own shares in the long run don't count because I'm now selling them off to um, fund a, a charity stuff, and it's going to be left in the hands of individuals. And, and stuff, he did yeah. talk about longevity at Berkshire with its mm-hmm. shareholder base as well. He talked about the doctors that have still yes. own Berkshire stock. One thing I thought was fascinating was he was talking about Geico. And he said that Geico in their first year of operation did $238,288 of business. And last year, 84 years later, um, uh, that figure was $35 billion. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was fascinating because it was a 15% cake over 84 years. Which is amazing. Yeah. But it's so many people are so seduced, especially nowadays and everything going on with the market we're gonna do a podcast talking about everything going on i thought it'd be kind of fun and you suggested as well um i feel like people are more seduced by higher numbers if someone heard like a 15 percent kager which could be crazy they would maybe not think that is a high enough return yeah but that's how financial companies can grow i mean if you read the um but it's fascinating to me, though, like what that actually means over 84 years. Very rarely do you see something 15% yeah. over 84 years to be like, wait, $238,000 turned into $35 billion. <laughs> You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's just well, continuous yeah. slugging if out, can, focus on the long If you can term. do 15% a year for 80 years, yeah. Mm-hmm. Then you have a fortune, obviously, yeah. Now, if you can do, if you take almost any amount of money, compound it at 15% a year for a human's lifetime, mm-hmm. you're going to do fine. You could start with almost nothing, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just thought those, it was interesting. Most companies don't last 80 years. So they don't, they don't compound it or anything. I mean, eventually they hit the time zero and they end up worthless. Mm-hmm. He gave his uh, never bet against America. Same thing that he was talking about in the Berkshire uh, meeting last year that was hosted on Yahoo. Never mm-hmm. bet against America. I really like that. But no, I mean, I just I really thought it was a great letter. I was surprised that there was some pushback on some stuff because he didn't okay. talk about the pandemic. Well, Anyone that knows Buffett knows that he's not going to probably talk about all those sort of things. I, he could have, I guess, talked about the pandemic and how it affected the company. Did you read the stuff? risk disclosure that they put about the pandemic? It basically is like the most vague, or I guess boilerplate one. Okay. Not extensive. It basically, at the end of it, says pretty much every company is uh, has these same risks. Okay. In a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, now we're going to see a lot of risk factors, including a pandemic, which is a 
not a good thing to put in your risk factors, but they will. Mm-hmm. Forever, even like 10. I yeah. also don't even, I mean, personally, my interpretation of the SEC's guidance on that is that you shouldn't include it, but everyone includes it. Mm-hmm. Because the SEC, there was a thing with SARS and stuff, and everyone put in SARS things after that. I mean, I don't think companies are supposed to put in risk factors that are not specific to their company, so or the industry. You're not supposed to put in risk factors that are we are a public company, we might lose money. We are, mm-hmm. we have a stock; it's yeah. volatile. Yeah, you, they you put them in, everything. but they're not supposed yeah. to do that. And I think that the real way to do it is movie theaters and restaurants and theme parks and things like that should say similar to the pandemic of. 2020 uh, we may you know that these things were shut down and that our business can lose money for years at a time and we depend on people being able to go to those places mm-hmm. you know um but now you'll see it probably in supermarkets and things that made more money that year mm-hmm. and they'll include pandemic risk when it's not even a risk i love when he said the best results occur at companies that require minimal assets to conduct yes. high margin businesses and offer goods yeah. or services that will expand their sales volume with only minor needs for additional capital. So this one, and there was also the insurance one, I think there is a hint from Buffett that some of Berkshire's best days are behind it and that it's a slow and steady sort of thing. He's saying here that we have capital intensive businesses and mm-hmm. that's actually true for all of Berkshire's things. Um, even insurance, which is not a capital intensive business in a sense, you're using other people's money is limited by how much it can grow and everything in relation to its return on equity. And it's very, um, I mean, if you think about it, Berkshire owns Apple, but put that one aside, everything else that Berkshire's in is regulated insurance, regulated utilities, regulated railroad. Mm-hmm. Those are all very slow and steady sorts of things and very different from most companies. Apple is the only one that's in a different compet- that competitive environment that's more like other companies and stuff. The other thing is when he said this stuff about the insurance thing, what I didn't say is that Berkshire's insurance companies things have gotten better and stuff. I do think one reason he says that they're going to have float at no cost is because he doesn't expect float to grow much at all and it may even decline a little. He said before about declines and stuff, almost as if it was a cyclical thing, but I think they've gotten to the point where he doesn't believe that Berkshire's float will really grow much over time because it's too high, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think they basically um, will may grow at inflation or a little bit better type rates over time. He doesn't expect it to fall off. And he gave a little extra sentence about that, I think. Um, Yeah, he did say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that just, it's more likely to be costless now because they're not fast growing and stuff. I think it's easier to keep their operation that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, he concluded the letter yeah. with probably one of the best things I thought in it okay. was that it's going to be the annual meeting is going to be held in Los Angeles and Charlie will be on stage with him. Right. It'll be virtual. It will be. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I missed him last year and more important, you clearly missed him. So I really love that, yeah. uh, that he's going to be there. And Charlie was just, uh, he just had his daily journal meeting, Yes, which was fascinating to watch. And we'll, we should probably do a podcast talking about everything that went on there. Um, but no, I was really happy to see that they're going to be together. I definitely missed that last year. I was pretty impressed with Buffett last time, last year, when he just sat there for, you know, three, four hours, he just talked and rambled and rambled and just went on and on and all by himself up there. Yeah. I mean, I felt this letter was similar to that. Um, that annual meeting where I think he, I think Buffett likes to come at things a little indirectly. He's uh, like being, it's like he's subtweeting someone. Okay. <laughs> you know? So I, I think he doesn't want to be quoted on taking a position on something, mm-hmm. but it is interesting what's on his mind and what he brings up and things like that. There's no, it's no coincidence that he's talking about the conglomerate era with you know, in right. 2020. No, I don't think it is. But I don't think he wants to comment on But I also think he's good in a few different ways. One, he do, doesn't want to be too controversial and stuff like that. He doesn't want to call out individual people, all of those sorts of things. He tries to be very positive about things. But also, I think generally he doesn't like to put in or even answer questions in ways that are very temporary. He doesn't like to, he likes to comment more on the long term, what's important. And so even if you do ask him a direct question about politics or whatever, he doesn't, he talks about like more what this candidate, why they would be moving in a direction over time that he is more what he wants to see or something. He's not very, he doesn't want to talk about the current news cycle. He doesn't want to give quotes of things that next Tuesday won't matter. 
you it's know, very timeless be on to stuff. something else. Yeah. Even 20 years from now, you could still say a lot of this same stuff right. is relevant. And so even if you go back and look at how he talked about junk bonds or how he talked about things like that, he tried to talk about it in a way that isn't just there's too much you're being issued this year and stuff, but things like this always happen in financial stuff. They'll keep always happening and, you know, it'll end badly. But, you know, he that's the sort of thing that he says, yeah. you know, Munger it's, says differently. I was going to say, it's just so funny how both of them get their point across differently because I believe Munger said... Mm -hmm. Wall Street will sell shit as long as there's shit to sell. Yes. <laughs> is he did what say he that. said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so they both have their own way of, of doing it, even though they probably agree or trying to say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought this letter was a good way of um, focusing. I mean, both the letter and the annual meeting, last annual meeting, we're trying to get people to look past just this year and on some of the more timeless things. Even the description that he gives about the conglomerate thing and everything I think is like you could read this decades later and it might apply to something else mm -hmm. that still matters yeah. to you. Mm -hmm. If I just talk to you about this pandemic, what good does that do you, you know? Mm -hmm. And also it's a topic on which everyone talks all the time. Yeah, he sure. likes to talk on topics that are a little bit like might get through to you, like mm -hmm. the, you know, or where he's also seen as more of an authority on those things, you know? Is that something you should put in your, you know, when you're thinking through potential risks, if there will ever be another pandemic? No, I don't think so either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've talked about it before. Uh, now, I mean, not a pandemic thing, but gone through the risks of what could happen mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, I don't think that, I don't think people will underestimate a, the risk of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. If anything, um, if there were to be a pandemic in the future, relatively near future, uh, it might be an opportunity to buy things because it happened recently in our past mm. and the initial reaction from the market was seriously down i mean uh, in like 1946 a lot of people 1945 46 a lot of people were convinced that there was gonna be another depression and we still know there was a depression and stuff but our concerns about that risk are so much less now there isn't very good reason for us to be less concerned in every recession now than there was in the one right then, mm -hmm. but that's because it was coming within 15 years of a huge uh, depression. So of course the very next one you think is going to be just as bad. You know, the first financial crisis of 2008, people would say, Oh, it's going to be horrible when it might be very run of the mill, you know? Um, so just, it's too in people's minds that way where you, where Buffett is good is he knows that. And he thinks about things that could happen that people don't worry, about. that will happen a few times, mm -hmm. you know? Um, instead of the most recent thing that people are worried about, which is, you know, and, and each thing will be different. That's the, I mean, the truth is that even if there's another pandemic relatively soon, people's responses to and stuff will be different. And the way that things will work out will be different. You know, um, people always expect to be exactly like the last time that they saw something happen mm -hmm. and it won't be, you know, final takeaways from this letter. Um, I, th I thought that it's the most, for a very long time, probably 20 years, it's the most um, clear indication Buffett's given of Berkshire being cheap. Um, I think he doesn't comment on the stock normally. Uh, but I think that he will buy back a lot of stock. And I think that he's given the impression that Berkshire's cheap versus other stocks in a way he hasn't since basically 1999. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cool. So if you're a shareholder, he's probably going to buy back a lot of stock. I think so. Yeah, I think that's true. Got he it. wasn't buying back in the pandemic. No, he was not. Which I think gives you another indication that he was worried about what could happen. And didn't want to do anything until he had a clear idea of how the government was doing stuff and what would happen. And then once he saw that, he was willing to buy back a lot, which is very consistent with him, I think. I think the big tell, so A, talking a lot about, you know, buybacks in this letter, but the fact that he trimmed Apple really shocked me. You know, so maybe it, then thinking about like different things from an opportunity cost and what he could use with his capital. Yeah, I was, I did write down a note about that. Like, okay, say you sell Apple and buy Berkshire you know, you're, you're paying tax on that and stuff, but what exactly are you doing? How much value are you creating or not? 
um, it is interesting. He's not trimming Apple, didn't sell that Apple because of um, a need to do so, nor because he likes to target certain portfolio percentage allocations. Yeah. So not like a mandate or anything. No. So he sold it for some reason because he preferred to doing other stuff than owning that Apple. Um, yeah, I don't know if he, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd be open to selling some Apple and buying back some Berkshire and saying, oh, that's a net gain for us, Mm -hmm. you know, but there are taxes and there are other concerns about that. And he doesn't really need to do it. Um, because I don't think he could buy Berkshire that fast that you need to sell that and Apple to buy it. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today. Make sure you hit that subscribe button either on the podcast app or on YouTube. And I've got a surprise for everybody. If you want to go and read all of Jeff's content, I'm in the process every single day. I spend a couple of hours putting it on focus compounding all the way back to 2004, 2005. Go to focuscompounding.com and on the header, you'll see free content. You do not need to be a member to get access to it. And you could go there and you can read uh, Jeff's investing journey, everything he was writing about going back to 2004 and 2005. I still have a lot of content to upload, uh, but if you want to follow along and check all that out, go to focuscompounding.com and it will be there for free. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today. And we will see you in the next podcast.